men died on Christmas Eve and were met by St. Peter at the pearly gates. And in honor of this holy season, St. Peter said to them, you must each possess something that symbolizes Christmas to get into heaven. Well, the first man fumbled through his pockets and pulled out the lighter. He put it on and he said it represents a candle. Well, you may pass through the pearly gates, St. Peter said. The second man reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of keys. Here we are. He shook them and said, these are bells. St. Peter said, all right, a little far-fetched, but you can go into heaven. Well, the third man searched desperately through his pockets and finally pulled out a pair of women's glasses. St. Peter looked at the man with a raised eyebrow and said, and just what do these symbolize? The man replied, they're carols. <laughs> the story just stops. It doesn't tell me whether he goes to heaven or not. I'm assuming he must have made it. While we approach Christmas and celebration of the birth of Jesus through the lens of the season of Advent most often, uh, it's not too often that we do so after just walking through the entire story of the Old Testament and encountering again the stories of blessing and obedience and blessings and disobedience. But that's exactly what we have over these last 18 weeks or so. I counted them up as 18 weeks. We've encountered the entire scope of the story of Scripture up to this point. In spite of it often being viewed as kind of scary and murky and confusing, I don't think it ended up this way. Was it that way for anyone? here that's been walking with it? I didn't think so. Uh, if you just were embarrassed to put your hand up, you can tell me a little bit later and we'll talk about it. <laughs> but like uh, all of those, at least it seemed to me, those good old Star Wars installments up to this point, the Old Testament left me wanting for more. Malachi leaves us with this sense and this tease that God's got another act upon which the curtain is going to open one. Indeed, it's that act that opens in chapter 22. Yet there's been a lot of history that has happened since last week's chapter that needs a little bit filling in, I think. And this is the Cliff Notes version. Judah, which was the, uh, the area that uh, was part of Jerusalem there where they were rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, continued to exist as part of the Persian Empire for two more centuries after we left it last week, and then it became part of the Hellenistic Empire, having been conquered by who? Does anybody know who, who brought about the Greeks? There we are, Alexander the Great. Do you know the date? Probably not. That's a little bit too much. It was 330 B.C. And culturally, that's very important, because with the Hellenistic domination, the Greek language, the Greek thinking, and Greek yogurt, yogurt, started spreading throughout the ancient world. Now we know where Greek yogurt comes from. Then about 150 years later came the Maccabean revolt with Judas Maccabees in charge of the army and Jews again gaining some political independence. And it was during this time, if you've ever wondered, that the flames of hope for a Messiah began to really burn. The independence that Judas Maccabeus won was always a bit shaky, though, with political threats advancing from the Syrians quite regularly. But then in 63, along came an even bigger uh, poser, and that was Pompey of Rome. Conquered Jerusalem and put Jerusalem and Judea all under Roman control, and Herod the Great was made to be king, or governor we might more accurately say, over the Jews by the Roman Senate. And that's the Reader's Digest version, really, of the context for the beginning of this story in the New Testament and how we got there. A nation under pagan rule, as it has been now for centuries, longing for independence, which would be uh, manifested as God's blessing and God's forgiveness for the sins of the past. They were longing for God himself to intervene and to take the throne of Israel once again away from all these pagan oppressions. And indeed, it was time for God's upper story plan of bringing salvation to break once again into the lower story of the lives of several 
who would have important roles in moving the upper story along. First, although we didn't read about it this week, Zechariah and Elizabeth, an older priest and his barren wife, are visited by messengers of God who tell them, wow, surprise, they're soon going to be expecting a baby. And then, to quite an unlikely young lady named Mary, did another messenger come and tell her that she would soon also be carrying not only a baby, but a very special baby. Now, so far in the story, as I reflected when I was putting this together, we've not heard too many detailed stories about the birth of the living. But, as I reflected back, we do have in Scripture the story of Samson, whose birth was heralded by an angelic messenger. And it was told of Samson before he was born that he would begin to deliver the people of God from the Philistines. Nothing is said in that story or in the story of John the Baptist about the conception of the child to be born to be anything but ordinary. Only in Mary's is it explicitly declared that the conception of this baby would be an act of the Holy Spirit. Now, would that need to be? Well, Matthew never tells us if there's a why for a lot of these details. We remember that of the two gospel accounts with the birth narrative, Matthew's the shortest. Luke seems to suggest that because of a supernatural conception, Jesus would be therefore called the Son of God. There's a lot of questions that we in our modern day mentality might have that Scripture just doesn't give us an answer to. But one thing I think that we can be completely certain is that in all of this, I believe that God was getting their attention and is seeking to get our attention as we receive they were signs that God was beginning to break into the everyday world again and to make an announcement that it is time to really start paying attention. And this is the place to pay attention to. It's sort of like taking a break. You know, we go to a concert or some sort of show that has an intermission, right? Uh, and you always hope for a good long second half as long as the first half. But we take a break and we talk and we go get refreshments and concessions go to the bathroom, and what happens just a few moments before the show curtain opens again? The lights dim a few times, don't they? Yeah. The lights begin to dim, and we know that it's time to be getting ready to be in our seats, because the spotlight is about to shine one more time, and the curtain is about to be pulled back, because the show is now going to go on. Now, a lot of us in the West, and maybe in the East too, have trouble believing that a story of a miracle like this that goes beyond our realm of experience. Therefore, we have trouble believing in the miracles in times of Scripture, whether it was Old or New Testament. And it's true, I think, that we don't see miracles on the scale of what uh, are reported, especially during Jesus' ministry. And yet today, miracles of physical healings are being witnessed in many places around the world. They really are. Last year, I uh, don't think I've ever shared this with you, but when I went to the ministry conference at Asbury Seminary last spring in uh, 2014, I got to hear Dr. Craig Keener, who's a, a professor there on campus. He's written uh, many books for InterVarsity Press, the uh, IB InterVarsity uh, Bible Commentary and Bible Background Commentary. He was featured during that conference, and he wrote recently a two-set uh, series called Miracles. And he shared some of the miracle stories that he has personally heard from and not witnessed, but heard from eyewitnesses about in uh, other parts, mainly in Africa. And this is one of the sections that he writes from in his book. He says, we have an explosion of miracles taking place, especially in conjunction, hear this now, in conjunction with the spread of the gospel. Some things are outside the norm for most Westerners, whatever kind of church we're associated with. It's probably good for us to shake us up. Extraordinary things are taking place around the world. And then he goes in to tell a tale that his mother-in-law uh, personally brought him face to face with. Uh, he says, my mother-in-law described how Therese was bitten by a snake. And by the time my mother-in-law got to her, she wasn't breathing. No medical help was available. She strapped the child to her back and ran to a nearby village where a friend who was an evangelist prayed for her. And she started breathing. I asked my mother-in-law how long Therese had stopped breathing. 
she thought about how long it takes to get up this hill and down this hill from one village to another. She said about three hours. Keener's suggestion is that God is using signs and wonders like this for the purpose of getting attention, the attention of people again, in places where the gospel is being shared, especially for the first time. And I believe that there are miracles that are around us that never do make the splash of Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, one of these that uh, I heard of personally and saw on the TV that's long before any of that was uh, when I was in seminary. And it was during the Ichthus Christian Music Festival. Some of you may have heard about that uh, um, uh, happens every year down there in the central Kentucky. It was happening in the midst of some strong stormy weather that April uh, or May week, and the weatherman on the 11 o'clock news showed us a radar image of how all of the area around the Ichthus farm was getting soaked with rain, while this eye seemed to keep the Ichthus farm dry for the duration of the music shows that night. And he said, right before he showed uh, that particular radar scope, he said, now, he said, I'm not, you know, proposing anything religious or miraculous here, I'm just showing you but he pointed out that right here is where the Ichthus Festival was going on. Wow. <coughs> Miracles are for getting our attention. Miracles confirm our faith in a God whose story includes sending us a Savior who brought sight to the blind and new life to the dead and who indeed was raised himself after three days in the grave. I know all of us probably like displays of firecrackers on the board. I grew up going to firecracker shows on the 4th of July in small towns whose firecracker display consisted of one firework singly after another, you know, one, oh that's nice, oh that's colorful, you know, just one after another. Some would call it boring, maybe by today's standards, especially in big cities I'm sure. Uh, we'd all though be waiting enthusiastically for the finale, right? Because it didn't matter how simple your show is, we saved up a gobble of fireworks and wonderful displays for that finale. It was going to be loud, and it was going to be colorful, and it was going to be a bright affair. And I think that's a good illustration for what's going to happen now as we continue to move forward in the story. Because everything up until now would soon be simply a footnote in time to the gift that Jesus brings. And this encounter with God that Mary had, and that others along this line had in, in the stories of the coming of John the Baptist and Jesus remind us once again of the depth of love in the heart of God for each and every one of us and the whole world to bring about such an amazing finale in sending Jesus to bring about the conclusion of the upper story and to bring about this miraculous sign to tell folks it's time to start looking and here's where to look for something new from God. It's Getting today. And I want us to finish this, this week by asking ourselves, have we experienced something that we might say is miraculous in our own life? Have you witnessed something happen to others that maybe God got your attention through? What did that say to you? How did you respond? Did you respond, okay, God, you got my attention now? I'm listening. I remember uh, last, it was a year or so, my, uh, my mom's sister's husband had had some surgery, a little procedure done, I think on his colon or something, uh, down in the lower parts, you know, and, and everything seemed to be going good after that for a few days, but what he didn't know is inside he was bleeding. And he just happened to be in the, in the company of a first responder, EMT or somebody, who saw him pass out and took his pulse within a few moments and he found no pulse. And he knew that he had completely bled out and got him into a hospital and was able to revive him through intravenous fluids. And he knew that it wasn't for the grace of God bringing those people together in that particular moment that, he, that they were, that he wouldn't be around today. And I know that he knew that God had gotten his attention those things happen to us, we say, oh, okay, God, I'm listening. What are you doing? What do you want me to do? And Mary answered the Lord, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be to me fulfilled. 
May we also open our hearts up to God breaking in on our lives to carry Jesus into the world once again. This is your story. This is my story. This is the greatest story ever told. As we respond to God's word today, we're going to uh, first sing 197, hymn 197 in our hymn books, Ye Who Claim the Faith of Jesus. And today, maybe the Lord has spoken to you through his word once again, and you have a prayer of commitment or a prayer of uh, intercession that you want to bring to the altar rail. The altar rail is open for your prayers of discipleship and your prayer of Christian commitment uh, or intercession, whatever that prayer might be. And I invite you to stand as you are able and let's sing joyously, ye who claim the faith of Jesus. 